nice talk. I feel a bit humbled because I'm, it's more down to earth. It's more maybe practical. It's not going maybe all the way to the stars. And, uh, and also, I will do a brief introduction about what I'm talking about. So uh, uh, just wait for when I'm finished to start firing questions. And actually, I have also a question to you guys. So the, um, briefly, I will, I will do an intro on, on uh, universal basic income and on cryptocurrencies. But cryptocurrencies, you all know probably about it. Universal basic income, maybe a bit less. And what my position is on that. And then I would welcome, I have a question actually. And we, I hope we engage in the discussion. Um, so, universal basic income, I assume everybody has heard about it. But the problem is that there are many shades of it. And so it may be good to start with what I understand as uh, universal basic income, what it should look like. And actually I'm saying universal basic income, but I should say it in full. It's a universal unconditional, this is very important, basic income. And um, there are also other words for it. One of them is uh, dividend of citizenship, popular in France. It's a bit tricky because of the citizenship element with citizen and with not. Another one which is quite good is um, the reward you get for simply being alive. Or to take what the, uh, 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 one of the slogan of the refugees movement and, and so-called illegal, undocumented immigrants, we are here. You are here, and because you are here, you get it. That's what the whole uncondition unconditionality is about. Everybody gets it. No distinction, no demand. What, does, what is the principal aim of the universal unconditional basic income? It's to do away with precarity. Precarity is the insecurity, the fact that you don't know what tomorrow is going to be like, whether you are, will be able to pay your rent or your mortgage, etc. All these kind of things. If an accident happens, what will you do? And the capitalist economy, as it evolves at the moment, throws more and more people into precarity. The idea that work is on demand, and so that I can call you to work today and not use you tomorrow, so you don't know what your income will be. All these kind of things should be addressed by the universal unconditional basic income, which gives you a floor to have a decent, if, of course, sober life. It's the bottom. That's also why it's very important that you see, at least to me, that you see uh, the basic income as a living income, that you don't have you don't necessarily have to supplement it. You are free to supplement it. And to that, it's that the basic, the universal unconditional basic income will solve to a large extent poverty, but will not abolish it probably. And it's not its aim to do completely away with, uh, uh, with poverty because that would infringe on the liberty of people to do whatever they want with the income they get. And for instance, if you want to waste your whole income on drinks, and, and then end up not being able to pay your rent, well, this kind of things will happen. What the, the basic in universal, well, I will, I will call it UBI from now on to make it easy. What UBI is not, in my view, is not aimed to achieve, is to, do, is to abolish inequality. It will reduce inequality, probably, or uh, uh, hopefully, but it will not abolish it because there again, it goes against the liberties. So inequality will stay. But what it will do, it will give people more security, less precarity, and hence the liberty to do what they would like to do in life. And one of the most important things is, for instance, to make choices which are not informed by the need to immediately get food and things like that. OK. What is also very important is that when you introduce uh, UBI, you do not do away with welfare, as we know it. The only thing you abolish are direct monetary transfer in the sense of social benefits and things like that. You keep the rest. It's very important because otherwise, while you are handing out money on one side, you take it away by making everything else much more expensive. And, and the end of it is that, uh, in the end, People are 
very often worse off, especially the people who need it, are worse off than they were before under the conditional social benefit payment. What you do away with is the cumbersome and extremely offensive bureaucracy of conditional benefit giving. That you need to be unemployed, you need to, be to prove that you are seeking employment, that you have to prove that you are really poor, that you have to prove this, that, that, and the other. You do away with this obnoxious bureaucracy and the cost which go with it. And uh, uh, the social benefit bureaucracy is probably not the biggest in the state, but it's surely the most obnoxious one. So you do away with that, but you keep the rest. Because otherwise, what you get, and it's a, a form of UBI, which has been advocated by uh, um, libertarians, uh, harsh neoliberals, they think, yeah, we will need to introduce it one day or another. Oh, that's fine, but then we can do away with all welfare. That's a very bad idea because if you do that, what you will get is that for a large number of people, the basic income will not be the minimum income, it will be the maximum income. That's not what you want. Now on cryptocurrency. That was what I had to say about how I understand universal basic income. And, uh, okay. On cryptocurrencies, I will be much shorter because I assume, wrongly or rightly, but I assume that in this audience, you know what cryptocurrencies are. What I will talk about is that uh, cryptocurrencies are not going to solve uh, very much, if anything, in the current economic troubles we are in. Why? Because the cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies are all based on a false idea of their main enemy, which is fiat, fiat currencies. Uh, fiat currency, is that a clear term for you? It's the money you have in your wallet. It's the money that is uh, guaranteed by the state, kind of owned by the state, and kind of issued by the state. Now we have a situation in which this system is broken, and in the view of advocates of cryptocurrencies, it's broken so much, it's totally horrible. The banksters, as they call them, have gone with your money, it's against your liberties and things like that. Well, my answer to that is that it uh, would be better to, uh, to fix the fiat currency system than to, uh, uh, the fiat, uh, the, sorry, the fiat money system, than to try to do something completely new and which is unproven. One of the things that you could do to fix the fiat, uh, fiat money system as it works at the moment, as it has been hijacked by banksters, as is, uh, who have privatized money, is to uh, end the war on cash. The war on cash is about uh, taking all uh, coins and, and banknotes out of circulation and making you pay always with card or other electronic media, your mobile phone or whatever what. Okay, so now it's time to state my basic principle which informs this talk. There are two. One is keep it simple and the other one is if I, it's a, it's a, a, a follow-up on the famous if it ain't broken, don't fix it. It is if it is broken, try to fix it. Don't assume that it is broken and then we have to do something completely new and, and get into it. Now, the idea of the universal basic income is simple. It's not that complicated. And it does address the problem of uh, maldistribution of income and the problem of uh, insecurity and precarity. Uh, cryptocurrencies are not simple. And they do not address properly the uh, broken system of, uh, of finance and money. A more background principle is about what is fairly popular in cryptocurrency circle and in IT circles in general, is the technological optimism and what uh, Yevgeny Morozov has called solutionism, meaning uh, making solutions via tech seeking technology to uh, resolve problems. My, my idea, or my, my attitude, is the Amish 
uh, the Amish uh, attitude to technology. The default mode is not to trust it, and to look, but then to look if it can be useful. And if it is useful, you adopt it, and you adopt it to your own purposes. But you do not believe, like unfortunately many people do, uh, driven by enthusiasm, and, but also driven because they understand it. But the people who understand IT are still a minority and will remain a minority. So, uh, the, m the main, main flaw of technological solutionism is that it seeks solutions, te technical sol solutions, technological solutions for what are political problems. It thinks that, politi that politics are completely wrong, will never get you anywhere, and that technology will solve these problems. That is true in small things and in practical things quite often, but it's not true in general, because every time you encounter again, and every time you have implemented a technological solution, you encounter political problems, which are still not solved. Okay. Uh, back to cryptocurrencies. What's, in my view, wrong with cryptocurrencies? They start from false ideas, false conception of what monetary creation is about. Why? Because monetary creation has become so incredibly complex that uh, the idea is that you have to address this complexity through technological IT means, whether I would advocate to reduce that complexity and make money much simpler and also much less important. And there maybe there is a kind of door to what Vinay was saying. Why do we use money as a kind of universal marker and un universal discriminant for everything? No, that's, 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 that, could be, that could be changed. The main point is that uh, based on this technological uh, solution, uh, solution seeking, uh, it attacks it, uh, it, uh, well, it attacks trust. You know, in, 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 in cryptocurrency parlance, there are trustless systems based on algorithms. Um, algorithms work very well to solve very practical things. I mean, it's very good that uh, there's an algorithm be behind your public transport card. Fine, that's okay. But it's not very good to be do general thing. Why? Because this whole idea of algorithmic trust, which would replace human trust, is based on a, uh, on a total lack of confidence, on a principled lack of confidence in human beings. The human being is the weakest link in the chain. That's more or less the, the idea, the, the, yeah, the credo. Elimination of the human being is then the idea. Now, after, if you want to know, uh, uh, if you want to read much more about that, I, there's one excellent book which, the, which uh, uh, describes that evolution of thought, because that's new. I mean, traditional society don't think in terms we distrust human beings. On the very contrary, they are based on human trust. Everything that happens, every important interaction is based on trust. Take, take one example of Chinese the traditional Chinese uh, way of trading is I trust you. One, one person, one man, one word. If you ever, if you ever betray that trust, you're out. That's the way how the system works. Therefore, there are no written contracts in olden days, no things. It's simply agreement from person to person or group of person to group of person. And that's always lived by because your reputation is at stake. Not only the business, your reputation. And once you lost your reputation, you are out. So this idea of doing away, and now I've, I've probably insulted already all believers in cryptocurrencies. Now I will insult more or less everyone here. This idea of lack in the human, in the human considering the human as the weakest chain, chain as the weakest element in the chain, is typically Anglo-Saxon. It's the Anglo way of thinking, informed by Protestantism, which has taken over, generally, it's a very rough generalization and simplification, I'm perfectly aware of it. 
but it lives, and it lives in the way that other societies, other cultures, to start, for instance, in Europe, with Southern Europe, don't like it at all. They object to it and they reject it. And they want something else. So a lot of techno-solutionism will ever, ever not fly or will be imposed by some kind of, of force. Not the force of tanks, but the force of banks, the force of the economy and things like that. Um, much more practical problem with cryptocurrencies is first the, uh, the universality of cryptocurrencies is very far away. I mean, how many crypto cryptocurrencies are these days? 2,600 or something like that? There are really a lot of them. And, uh, and that's really not practical for general use. If you want an example of in history, before the creation of the uh, uh, United States Federal Reserve, there were many, many, many dollars, all issued by many different banks, and that was really not very good for trade and for, for, for interaction and so. <laughs> and then came the Federal Reserve and it centralized the thing. There, the word has fallen, centralized versus decentralized. I am a believer in decentralization, but not to the utter limit. Okay, the other problem with crypto, which is even worse, it's usability. The usability of uh, cryptocurrencies outside IT circle is next to nil, I'm sorry to say. So <coughs> ask, I mean, you have a few shops which accept Bitcoins, to take an example, but really, and it's, and it's still, it's going nowhere. Why? Because uh, advocates of cryptocurrency say, ah, come on, you're an old man, you have seen, uh, you, you don't want to renew, but the younger generation, they will naturally come to it. It's a natural evolution. We, will, we'll, we have adopted all kinds of technologies before, and, and, and so we'll do the same with, uh, with, with that one. I'm not really sure about it. First, a lot of people are still not in and will not be in. And I also see that the younger generation is slowly rejecting the total, uh, uh, this whole thing, it's not only cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies is part of the thing which make a lot of people feel that they are living in a machine park and that they have to submit to machines rather and to programs and to systems devised outside them, above them, which they often do not understand, but which they have to follow. So they feel oppressed by it, they reject it. And if they do that, they are very often outside a lot of things of society. So they can choose to another life and then they live in this kind of parallel universe. And they don't feel really happy about that either. Uh, cryptocurrencies, are not and will for a long time, if ever, they are not suitable for mass consumption at last, for a lot and lot and lot of reasons. They will need to be adopted generally to be exactly what they do not want to be, that is to be intermediated. And why? Because the complexity, the, uh, 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 the knowledge you need to have to adopt and, and use cryptocurrencies in the way they are intended to, is and will remain above uh, what most people can or want to, to do. Arian Kampheis has said once that you cannot simplify crypto endlessly. So, in a certain sense, you have a floor under which you cannot come with crypto systems unless you outsource their use or their ownership to other parties. On the other hand, most people men, uh, are not able and cannot go beyond a certain point of understanding the technology. And the gap between the two, the gap between the floor on one side and the ceiling on the other is something like that. So the result is that cryptocurrencies will either remain the preserve of elite geeks, or it will be the norm of a geek-ruled world. I don't think that is what we really want. So, 
now finally to universal basic income meets cryptocurrencies. That's the moment I will have to ask you a question because I've identified three and only three arguments in favor of doing that. In, that is to merge the two, I mean to uh, distribute, to conceive and distribute UBI with the help of, with the use of cryptocurrencies. One is that it will resolve the funding problem of UBI because there is of course a very big problem if you give everybody a living, a living allowance, is who is going to pay for that? My idea is very simple, the money is simply there. It's very, it's very possible, but okay, uh, 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 it, will, it will cost really a lot of money and especially it will cost more, introducing UBI will cost more than, uh, uh, than what the uh, social benefit at the moment costs, especially if you keep the welfare state in place. So you really will have to, uh, to uh, realize more resources, to mobilize more resources to pay for it. Now, cryptocurrency would be uniquely suited to address that problem because they address the problem of money creation. Well, they don't, in my view. So, cryptocurrencies are supposed to solve the funding problem. It would also, it's also supposed to solve, they're also supposed to solve the distribution problem, the monetary distribution problem, because, hey, we do away with the state, we do away with banks. People, uh, uh, it's, it, it all, the system, takes care for, for the people. Um, that's not going to work very much. And then finally, cryptocurrency will give you the anonymity, the privacy, and the freedom. That last one, yes, maybe, but that can be also achieved by other means, which, again, are more simple. Um, So the, pool, the, the three arguments I've, I've told are, well, I said it already, they are pool, they are, uh, uh, they the arguments score poorly on all these three counts. On the funding side, they score not very good, of not at all, in the monetary distribution is, uh, is, uh, is a problem because of the usability of cryptos, and finally, the freedom and the anonymity and privacy aspect can all be addressed by other means, one of which is, for instance, not abolishing cash. Uh, there are complex, there are much more complex arguments in favor of uh, cryptocurrencies together with UBI. Uh, one of them is called resilience, but it's something different. I'm not going to address that. And it includes the word I've not used at all till now, and I will use it only in a quote that uh, decentrally organized crypto basic income is very much promoted in the blockchain space. I didn't use the word blockchain. I think, in, in to put it very crudely and maybe again insult quite a number of people, I think to the digerati, the blockchain is what for leftist Cuba used to be and now is Rojana. So, um, well, I've come to the general conclusion. I hope I can read it. Yes, joining UBI and crypto is actually a fantastic idea. It's brilliant. It's, it's, it's a fantastic exercise of thought. It's totally unpractical, but at least it has the merit of moving the discussion forward. It's at least it makes you think about cryptocurrencies, it makes you think about the monetary system, it makes you think, if you join the two, about what UBI is or should be. So, in that sense, I'm, I'm very glad ab about it, and I said about techno-solutionism and, and technological optimism, it's not my cup of tea, but I enjoy and I encourage people to express ideas in this discussion, in this direction, because it fuels the discussion. But, the Unpracticability uh, of joining the two is because, I'm sorry to say, cryptocurrencies are based on 
uh, flawed idea of economics, of social life, and of politics. And to remind, and insofar that they want to address the problem of money with technological solution, I quote Margaret Thatcher, money is primarily a political problem. That's why she never wants to be in the euro. <laughs> Basically, that's it. And my question to you is, do you have other arguments in favor of cryptocurrencies uh, to implement a system of universal and conditional basic income? And the rest are your questions. <laughs> So, very straightforwardly, I'm ignorant of these topics, so can you give a sketch, at least, of how you would implement UBI within a cryptocurrency? I, I, don't, I don't see how, you know, th there are still two ideas floating around next to each other yep. with no string connecting yep. them, no, this bit comes, fits in their diagram to tell me how on earth that might work. Uh, probably, probably the idea, as I understand it, as I understand the proponents of the idea have they seen it. The most famous is Dunitaire, but there are more. It goes, uh, on one hand, it goes through a complicated, no, complicated, I mean, it goes to a very technological thing. I'm not a coder, so that part I cannot explain. But it also goes through a, a radical revolution of money. And uh, in a certain sense, before joining the two, you have to reform money. You have to take money into, out of the sphere of governments and of banks and do it through, the, through a cryptocurrency. Once you have the cryptocurrency, you use the cryptocurrency to give to everybody, uh, to, give, to implement that universal income. But it's, it's not a direct thing. It's not that we have UBI here and we have, uh, uh, we have cryptocurrency there and then we are going to join them. Because first you have to have cryptocurrencies having a, a, a traction, having a validity. And for that, basically, you have to do away with the monetary system as we know it. I, I sort of understand that you would have to have this revolutionary change to using cryptocurrency. And I get the loose sketch of the idea. I've got a big voice. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. I'll use a big I'm voice. Great. So, so straightforward, I do understand, well that is the other solution, yes. Um, the, the, you know, the, okay, so you have a cryptocurrency and uh, assume that we have made the revolution and everybody's got cryptocurrencies and that's how everybody does cash. It, it's implausible for various reasons, but whatever. Um, who is going to give me my basic income? Where am I getting it from? Who, who's causing those bitcoins to land in my bitcoin account, as it were? What is the mechanism that causes the economy to somehow spit some money back into my, into my income as my UBI? How, how is that proposed to work? I mean, I, I can't, if I can't even begin to contemplate what they're doing there, I can't address what question you're asking me. For that, you have to read and believe in, uh, I failed to write it down, so I don't know exactly what the adjective is that goes before theory of money. So let's call it the new theory of money. But if you look at, uh, if you look, for instance, at this resilient thing, uh, among other, developed by a guy who is called Johan Nugen. Two, Nugen, Nugen, is that the right word? Yeah, jo Johan Nugen. Um, it's it's uh, it's one of the, and he has a very very uh, how you call it. It goes much further than UBI. It's 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 a complete system. Um, you have a, syst uh, a monetary system which is fed by the people themselves. People are creating that money at the same time as they are using it. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, of course, technology-driven, technology-engineered and technology-maintained way of redip redistributing income and resources as they are. So that's indeed where you, you see a complete revolution of money away from fiat, Away from centralization, you have a completely decentralized system where the receivers are the producers at the same time. And of course, you assume that some receivers are producing far more than they receive, and that will be redistributed. It's a very 
there are studies about it. It's, it's complex. It goes beyond, beyond what I understand, by the way. But yes, that's, that's the idea. Can use this. You can use this. Yeah. Yeah. Does it work? Yes, yes, it works. Ah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I always say that the French Revolution was done without public address systems, so, and there were far more people joining than you guys here. So, um, uh, I've done a bit of work on how you do basic income using blockchains. Yeah. Uh, it's That's not good. that hard at a technical level. So th the trick is that you need identity. So you need to know who you're giving the income to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but states already have pretty decent identity records. And the model that I proposed was that you basically just set up a blockchain run by a state. The state sets up a smart contract that gives every citizens of tokens. And the tokens just float on a market. So you basically do one coin per person per day. And you just wait and see what people do with it. And you wait for it to establish a market value. If you then require some ability to peg that to something, you then peg it to a tax discount. And at that point, you're beginning to provide some backing for the currency. And maybe you then gradually begin to float the thing as a basic income on a separate monetary base to the regular currency. And I think something like that could be introduced as a parallel currency right alongside of the existing fiat system mm -hmm. fairly painlessly as an experiment. Mm -hmm. And then if it turns out that it stabilizes, you simply switch those payments over so that they're now being made uh, actually in fiat currency. Or you back the tax system using those tokens and you basically force them into exchangeability using uh, tax discounts. Mm -hmm. um, so I think at a practical, technical level, it's not that hard a problem. Oh, Christopher? I just want to add that if, if, it, if something like that is backed by tax discounts, then it's equivalent to a fiat currency, because that's what gives uh, a fiat currency its value, is that the state demands taxes in that yeah. unit. Uh, so uh, in that sense, it's just an accounting exercise. Yes, yeah. so uh, you know, on the, uh, I will say on a technical level, I don't think this is that bad a problem. What will happen at a social level, I have no idea. But if you're ever worried about the technology, I've taken a look at it. I don't think it's that bad. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. My, my answer to that, without going into the blockchain thing, uh, is that uh, uh, um, the impl implementation problems you will encounter on the road are quite, are, are quite numerous. Uh, you are aware, for instance, identity is an extremely tricky thing. And proof of identity to two names is, is, really, is really complicated when the scale is very, very large. And then you get a battle, yes, but uh, 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 technology can solve that. Um, in practice, you, you've seen in India at the moment, introduction of the Adha system is, is really, uh, uh, it, it, it's really not working as it is, is supposed to be. On, on the side of... Not very practical, is it? Yeah. Um, on this. Okay, like this. Yeah. Uh, on the side of, um, as you correctly state that, the other person correctly states that fiat money is uh, given out by the state and its principal function then for the state is that you pay tax in it. But there's also a very great element of trust that people put into it. And, uh, and uh, then, if you replace that by cryptocurrencies, apart from from uh, from all all technical and all knowledge uh, problems, you encounter again this problem of trust. I think. I think. And again, we come back to the base argument: it's not that simple. So, in the sense of keeping it simple, the the system we have at the moment may be very suboptimal. But there's a thing that we have and most people are completely confident with. It's, it will be a very long way and it will be very painful and complicated, especially for less gifted people, which form a large, uh, a large uh, uh, portion of the population, to, to take that road. So I would rather try to, to fix the system as it is than to implement new things. But OK, I agree. You can, you can run in parallel, you can make experiments. The big problem with experiments is, is, scaling, is scaling them up. And at, uh, uh, 
if we have to scale it up to the population at large, even if it is in one country, there are already, there are already quite, quite some difficulties, but okay. I believe uh, a lot of things can uh, coexist. Um, yeah. So I believe both in, uh, in social trusts and in algorithmic trust, for instance. You can have both at the same time, and people can choose what systems they want to use. And I think this leads to um, flexibility rather than yeah. incomprehensible complexity. Uh, so for instance, you mentioned all these uh, cryptocurrencies. There are so many of them, 2,600 or whatever. <laughs> and. Uh, but before the central bank, you also had a lot of uh, other currencies, and people are trying to get back to local currencies, local geographical currencies, which uh, increases flexibility, but also complexity if you try to view the whole system. And I think you can look at uh, cryptocurrencies in the same vein as you look at local uh, currencies. So I think they will increase flexibility and make more choice for people. And um, also, I'm skeptical to the centralized power, the centralized banks, all the cycles, the crash and burn cycles, etc. And it's always regular people who gets hurt by the by the crashes. So, so I think when you have uh, new money systems like cryptocurrencies or local currencies or whatever, then then the then the people locally or everybody gets a lot lot more economic power than if you are dependent on the financial big banks and all that. I, I completely agree with that, and in, in case I've given a different impression, it's all my, uh, it's all my fault, of course. Um, yes, the only thing is that uh, uh, not all cryptocurrencies are comparable, and, not, and uh, uh, cryptocurrencies are not always comparable with local currencies. Local currencies serve very definite and very good goals. My idea of, uh, of decentralization versus centralization is in fact that the two can exist together. You, 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 but it's good to keep some, a few things, not obligatorily, but in existence, centralized. So it's good to keep, I think it's very good to keep a central bank. Only you should revise both the ownership, the way the central bank is led, and what the central bank does. But uh, uh, it's not a, ba a bad idea the, uh, to, to keep it. The worst thing you can do, and unfortunately it happens quite, quite often, is to impose uh, one solution. And especially impose a, techn a technological solution, which people uh, uh, don't understand, feel as coming from above, and which they are forced to use. And, and some, some cryptocurrencies have this tendency, the, the basic premises of Bitcoin, for instance, is that it is an alternative currency, not a complementary. Local currencies are complementary currencies. They exist, they coexist with the, with the fiat currency, which they seek to, uh, to not so much to replace as to reduce in, in, in the local sphere, but they do not pretend to abolish it completely. Alternative currencies want to replace the existing currency with their currency. Um, as long as you don't impose a, a specific system, of course everybody is free to take whatever they want. In the case of both UBI or uh, coupling UBI with cryptocurrencies, you could, but you should not impose it. And for most people, the best way to receive their, uh, to receive their uh, universal, their basic income, would be to receive it in fiat currency, especially in the sense that they can do whatever they want with it. Because one of the most important things about uh, giving people that kind of money, especially people who will not make very much money above it, is to give them the freedom to spend it as they want, and not to block their and not to block their uh, disposable income, as it happens at the moment. You see at the moment that the tendency is that an ever larger amount of money people receive is blocked in the sense that they have uh, tax to pay, uh, uh, rent to pay, mortgage to pay, interest rates to pay, uh, health insurance to pay, car insurance to pay, etc., etc., etc. And what you see that the proportion of freely disposable income even when income rises, diminishes. And, and one, one of the things that both UBI 
and fiat currency freely disposable, for instance, in cash, or with anonymous electronic payments, like DigiCash was uh, proposing and developing some 15 years ago, 20 years ago, or even longer time ago, I can't remember. Uh, that's what is giving freedom to the people. Yeah. Just a short comment on the last there, DigiCash. Yeah. The problem with DigiCash was that it was centralized, and because it was centralized, then the central banks or the old banks could uh, shut it down. So that's that's why the cryptocurrencies are so uh, decentralized. They have to be they have to be in order to be allowed to exist. Uh, if not, the central banks and the, and the big banks would shut them down or take control. That, that depends on the legislation. That's that's true. But uh, uh, the main the main uh, uh, the main advantage of DigiCash was, apart from how it was run, it was guaranteeing you anonymity. All right. Um, uh, thank you very much. I think it has been um, quite enticing so far. And um, yeah, right now I'm sorry that we have taken much of uh, the lunch break, but um, I think it's all of our benefit anyway. So we'll be back here at um, 2 o'clock and um, pretty much continue with, the, with today's session. And uh, yeah, enjoy your lunch, people. Thank you. <laughs>